and welcome to the latest episode of Crad COVID Readings. I'm Keith R.A. DeCandido, entertaining you with readings of my writings. Uh, I previously read a story called The Ballad of Big Charlie, which was part of a shared world called V Wars, created by Jonathan Mayberry. Uh, v Wars has been the subject of several different uh, short story anthologies by a variety of different authors, all pulled together by Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan also did a bunch of comic book series uh, under the V Wars banner. And it was actually adapted into a Netflix series that aired last year, uh, starring Ian Summerholder. And um, V Wars, is, the concept of V Wars is a really nifty one. It's, it's uh, as I say, I like to say when I'm pitching it, it's uh, doing something new by doing something old. Uh, a virus is unleashed that turns people into vampires, but what vampire they turn into depends on the folklore of their ethnic heritage. So it actually goes back to the original vampire legends that are part of every single culture on Earth, um, without all the extra baggage of vampires that have accrued over the uh, years since uh, the 19th century when people started writing fiction about vampires. Um, anyway, uh, in The Ballad of Big Charlie, we met a character named Mia Fitzsimmons, who was a reporter for the New York Daily News. And the follow-up story I did, which was in the uh, fourth V Wars anthology, Night Terrors, uh, was the fourth one. I lose track. <laughs> it was called uh, Streets of Fire, and I'm going to read that for you now. Alberto Soriano held his hand out to indicate the neighborhood around Bryan Park, a bit of green wedged in at the intersection of Fordham and Kingsbridge Roads. In Spanish, he said, this is, this all is yours now, my brother. Rafael nodded. I won't be letting you down. I ain't like Sammy Jr. Alberto pointed a finger at Rafael. Don't go dissing Sammy. When he got his ass busted, he could have given us up to the DA, but he keeping his mouth shut. He is, he's a good soldier. Again, Rafael nodded. Alberto led Rafael up Kingsbridge Road, past the big new library. It was after midnight, and most of the shops were shuttered. As they walked up the hill, Alberto pointed at Poe Park, where Kingsbridge intersected with, with the Grand Concourse. Remember, don't be dealing at the park. Cops be all up in that, especially since they put in that visitor center. They walked under a tree in front of the library. What about that crew from down the concourse? I hear they'd be, they be moving up. With a snort, Alberto said, Don't you worry about worry, worrying about those pendejos. Now, st the stash houses move for... Uh! That last was after a sharp object rammed into his neck. He couldn't talk, could barely breathe. Looking up, he saw a big black dude sitting in the tree overhead. He mostly looked like your average banger with a ball cap on sideways, baggy pants, t-shirt, and hoodie. Mostly because he wasn't wearing sneakers, or any other kind of shoes, because he had big-ass hooks instead of feet, and one of those hooks had impaled Alberto's neck. Rafael cried out in English, A fucking Bonsi! Alberto knew that the crew down the concourse had hired assassabansoms for muscle. A lot of black dudes with the V-virus turned into Bonsies, and besides the hook feet, they also had iron teeth and mad strength. It was getting harder and harder to breathe. Alberto flailed, trying to get his hands on the hooked foot to pull it out of his throat. Fuck you, Bonsi! Rafael ran straight for the tree. Eyes widening, Alberto tried to yell for Rafael not to get his stupid ass killed, but he couldn't do more than just gurgle. His mouth tasted salty and wet with blood. And then his eyes widened further when he saw Rafael's hands and face alter shape. A snout grew on his nose, and his fingers turned into what looked like giant suction cups. He's a vamp! Alberto had no idea that Rafael had the vampire virus, and that it was a damn chupacabra. If he'd known the boy was a chup, he'd have put him in security instead of dealing. Rafael leapt up into the tree and boxed the Bonsi's ears. The Bonsi screamed and snarled, thrashing against Rafael's grip. Alberto's crew had a few chups, and they sucked the blood right out of you with their hands. All three of them fell out of the tree in a heap. Alberto barely even noticed the impact, even though it scraped up his arm, as he was having a harder and harder time breathing. There were spots in front of his eyes. Alberto tried to scream as the hooked foot ripped out of his throat, but he couldn't. His vision started to blur, but he saw the Bonsi bite down on Raphael's shoulder with his iron teeth. Raphael screamed, but kept his grip on the Bonsi's head. Alberto's eyes went dark, and a moment later, he couldn't hear anything either. Squinting against the early morning sunlight shining in her face as she walked down 106th Street toward the East River, 
Mia Fitzsimmons stared at the entrance to the tenement building she was approaching and wondered if someone was playing a joke. Double-checking her phone, shielding the display with her hand against the sun, she verified that this was the address that Detective Trujillo had texted her after her editor, Bart Mosby, told her that the mayor's office had approved her request. The top three floors of the dark brown stone building had boarded up windows, but the second floor windows were uncovered and had fluorescent bulbs alight on the ceiling and evidence of people moving around. When she walked up the small stoop to the front entrance, she saw that a metal box had been placed next to the doorbells with an NYPD sticker and another sticker with the letters VCU scrawled in Sharpie under it on either side of a big red button. Gamely, Mia pushed the button. A burst of static exploded at her, which Mia, as a lifelong New Yorker, easily translated as, who is it, as heard over a crummy intercom system. Mia Fitzsimmons from the Daily News. A moment later, a low buzz emitted from the wooden door to the tenement, and Mia pushed it open. She entered a very narrow hallway, at the end of which sat a bored-looking middle-aged black woman at, with a, in a sergeant's uniform with a nameplate that read Buckland. Without even looking up from her romance novel, the sergeant said, They're waiting for you upstairs. As Mia approached, Buckland handed out, held out a visitor badge on a clip, still not looking up from her book. Mia flashed her driver's license, just so she can say that she did, and took the badge, clipping it to the collar of her blouse. The wooden stairs creaked as she climbed them. At the landing, she, opened, she found an opening to a huge room dotted with support posts that took up almost the entirety of the second floor. Scattered about was metal desks and metal chairs on wheels. On the far side of the room were a series of whiteboards with pictures and writing, and on both sides there were makeshift floor-to-ceiling walls that created an illusion of privacy. A tall, lanky African-American detective saw her and asked, Can I help you? I'm Mia Fitzsimmons. I was the detective nodded. The reporter, right. We're getting ready for the top of shift confab, so come on over. Several cops in plain clothes were rolling their chairs toward the set of whiteboards. One was leaning on a cane and looked like he was in pain. Mia wondered why he didn't sit down. There was only one other woman in the room, a surprisingly slight Latina. The rest were men, many with thick, short mustaches, as cops were the only subset of humanity who never got the memo that those mustaches went out in 1979. One of those was the only person she recognized by face, Hector Trujillo, who had been a detective in the 24th Precinct before being reassigned to the Vampire Crimes Unit. The one with the cane said, Okay, let's come to. Polonax, who is this? That last was said as the tall detective led her toward him. Trujillo stepped forward before Detective Mullinax could respond. Uh, this is the reporter, Sarge. Uh, Mia Fitzsimmons from the news? Right. You reach out a hand. I'm Sergeant Mike Yanov, commander of the VCU. You are going to do every single thing I tell you, or that any of my people tell you. Failure to do exactly what anybody in this room tells you will result in your privileges being revoked and you being kicked out of the VCU. Clear? Being sure to return the handshake as firmly as her small hands were able, Mia said, my editor and I already worked out the terms with the commissioner and the mayor, Sergeant. I'm here to write an article about the VCU and what it does. The NYPD has the right to read the article before it's printed. Mia left out the part about how the NYPD had no control over the content, only the ability to object, and the news was under no obligation to do anything about those objections. She thought mentioning that might just piss the sergeant off. That might be a problem. Most of these guys can't read. Yanov said those words in the same clipped tone he'd been using all along and Mia couldn't tell if he was kidding or not. But then Trujillo grinned. Hey, come on, Esposito just finished Dick and Jane yesterday. Mia shook her head. Well, that means he's already more literate than most of the new subscribers. That earned her chuckles from both Trujillo and Mullinax, but Yanov just stared at her. Don't try to be funny, Fitzsimmons. My apologies, Sergeant, it won't happen again, Mia said gravely. Pointing with his cane at a chair that was on the periphery of the gathering cops, Yanov said, sit over there. Take all the notes you want, but don't record... Mia interrupted. I can only record a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and then only if the other person gives prior permission. I really did work this all out with the commissioner. And now you're working it out with me. Go sit down. Nodding, Mia went to the indicated chair. Looking away from Mia, he raised his voice only slightly. All right, people, let's get to work. Within a moment, within moments, all the cops were seated. Yanov pointed with his cane at Mia. First off, we have a guest, Mia Fitzsimmons, the commissioner and the mayor, and the editors of the Daily News, have decided to embed a reporter with the VCU for a month so that the general public will have an idea of what we do here. A red-haired detective raised his hand and said, So she's gonna write about how we sit on our asses all day writing reports that read like brand fucking Stoker? 
Yanov fixed the detective with the same look he'd given Mia when she tried to engage in witty banter. First of all, Sullivan, it's Bram Stoker. Short for Abraham, not something you eat for fiber. Second of all, that's only what she'll write if she only talks to you, which I may make her do if I feel like punishing her. Everyone in the room chuckled, including Sullivan. Try not to make us look too bad, Yanov said dryly, on the off chance that someone out there actually reads her article. Now Yanov pointed his cane at one of the pictures on the whiteboard, which showed three people lying in a bloody heap on a sidewalk. One had an odd face that indicated that he had I1V1, but Mia couldn't tell from the angle what he was. Another was very obviously an assassin based on the hooks where his feet used to be. This, the sergeant said, is the triple at Poe Park last night. What do we have there, Thorndyke? A massive white guy who barely fit in his chair, the thing squeaked in protest every time he shifted his considerable weight, said, uh, Got us a Bonsi, a Chup, and a Normal. Uh, the Chup is Rafael Gesa, uh, the Normal's Alberto Soriano, and the Bonsi is Jason Johnson, street name Chops. Trujillo asked, He called that before or after he got vamped? Mia smiled. Chops would be an understandable nickname for someone who had metal teeth. Thorndyke shrugged his massive shoulders. Fuck if I know. That's just what's on his sheet. Anyhow, uh, Emmy on the scene says Gesa killed Johnson, and Johnson killed both Gesa and Soriano, but the bodies got sent to Muck to be short. Mia frowned, wondering who Muck was, but knowing better than to interrupt. Yanov said to Thorndyke, You said he had a sheet? Uh, yeah, Johnson's known associates include half the bangers on the concourse, and Vice says that Soriano's in charge of most of University Heights drug trade. Gesa's got no record, so we don't know if he's in the game or just got caught up in a drug hit. Could be two vamps clashing, too, Molinax said, uh, fighting over who gets to suck Soriano's blood. Mia started tapping her pen on her notebook. Everyone turned to look at her. Yanov asked, you have something to add, Fitzsimmons? Suddenly self-conscious, Mia considered saying nothing, but figured she had the opening. It's just that chupacabras absorb blood. They don't suck it. And a sense about some aren't interested in blood at all. There's nothing to clash over here. They both could have taken what they wanted from Soriano. Yanov stared at her for a second, then looked at Thorndyke. You said Muck has the bodies? Thorndyke nodded, which gave the which given that he had no discernible neck, which just seemed he seemed to just go from chin to shoulder, looked really bizarre. Fine. Take Sullivan to the morgue and uh, take the reporter with you too. Sure, Thorndyke said. At the same time, Sullivan leaned back, ran a hand through his red hair, and actually whined like a teenager. Oh, come on, Sarge, why me? Yanov pointedly ignored Sullivan's plaintive request. Now, next up. Simon Uspinov slowly walked down the street that was labeled with the sign Brighton 11th Street, but which everyone in Brighton Beach just called 11th Street. The distinction was necessary because Brooklyn had several 11th Streets. Bay 11th Street in Bay Ridge West, in Bay Ridge West, uh, I'm sorry, in Bay Ridge, West 11th Street in Gravesend, East 11th Street in Sheepshead Bay, North and South 11th Streets in Williamsburg, plus the regular old 11th Street in Park Slope. Slope. Simon thought it was just stupid. Just name the streets or normalize the numbers like they did in Manhattan. Mostly he focused on the inanity of the multiple 11th Streets because it was a handy way to avoid what he was facing. About halfway between Ocean View Avenue and Cass Place sat a small diner wedged in between a medical center and a place that had floor tiles, sold floor tiles. In the four years since he'd emigrated to the States, he'd never even been invited to set foot in the diner, and he'd been hoping to go at least four more years without, ha without having done so. The eatery was labeled only with a battered off-white sign that had the word diner in both English and Russian stenciled in red. The dirt street glass door deliberately hadn't been cleaned any time recently as he kept anyone from seeing inside. Simon pushed the glass door inward to be greeted by a small counter on the left and four booths on the right. A very large man with a very visible sidearm sat at the counter, sipping a cup of coffee. Someone sat to his right, but Simon's view of the person was obscured. As Simon entered, a man in a white apron moved from behind the counter to the back room. Only one booth was occupied by the man Simon was here to see. He was unassuming, with a pudgy middle negating the effect of his broad shoulders. His button-down shirt was open to form a v-neck and display both a salt-and-pepper hairy chest and a gold chain around his neck. He had a cigarette dangling from his mouth, which violated New York City's indoor smoking ordinances, and a samovar on his left. As Simon entered the diner, the man at the booth poured more tea from the samovar into his glass cup while flipping through this week's edition of Ruskaya Reklama. 
Simon did not, not know the man's name. Everyone just referred to him as Drakon. After flipping a few more pages, Drakon finally spoke in Russian without looking up. Okay, Simon, where is my heroine? I am sorry, but... Now Drakon looked up, waving an upraised finger back and forth. No, I am not interested in apologies. I asked a question. I expect an answer. Where is my heroine? Simon blew out of breath. It was stolen! Yes. Yes, it was. That is the fourth shipment from Afghanistan I have lost. No, I misspeak. The fourth shipment you have lost. I have changed the routine each time, but it is as if they can read my mind. I doubt there is much to read. You failed, Simon, and I am running a multi-million dollar business. Also, who are they? Shifting his weight from foot to foot, Simon said, I do not know. I think Armenians at first, but the heroin they're putting on the streets is from Mexico. Uh, maybe the Dominicans? The Chinese? After sipping his tea, Drakon said, You have no idea, do you? Simon lowered his head. He honestly thought it was the Armenians, but his people had checked into it. No. That is what I thought. He looked over at the counter. The big man nodded and got up from the stool. Now Simon could see the person next to him, a very old woman wearing a shabby gray dress. She turned on the stool and Simon got a good look. Her face was incredibly pale and wrinkled, her nose huge and bulbous, her lips so thin it looked like someone had drawn a, a line in pencil under her nose. But what stood out were her eyes. At first, she had them closed, which was just bizarre, but when she opened them, Simon understood why. Simon Usmanov would spend the rest of his life trying to figure out how to describe the deep wells of horrendous darkness that he saw behind the old woman's eyelids. As soon as she looked at him, a sharp pain started in his abdomen, even as a migraine struck him with the force of a freight train. Buckling to his knees, he tried to breathe and snuffled, as blood was now pouring from his nose. Bracing himself on the dirty Formica floor, he found it hard to inhale. Somehow he realized as the pain spread to every part of his body, it wasn't a surprise that Drakon employed an eretica. It took Simon a very long time to die, and every moment of it was racked with agony. Mia tumbled out of the back seat of the department issue Chevy, trying to get her bearings. Giving Sullivan an accusatory look as he got out of the driver's seat, she then turned to Thorndyke, who unfolded his massive frame from the passenger seat. He always drive like that? Thorndyke grinned, showing yellow teeth. Nah, usually he's reckless. Sullivan shrugged. What? You gotta drive on the FDR like that. They had taken the FDR drive from 106th Street down to 34th Street, then traveled over first to 1st Avenue and 30th Street, parking the car in a no-parking zone while placing their NYPD credentials on the dashboard. Mia had lost track of the sudden lane changes and the number of cars Sullivan had cut off by the time they passed 96th Street. My old man, Sullivan said as he headed toward the entrance, he always said that you knew you would be okay driving in New York if you could navigate the FDR without shitting in your socks. In that case, I want to see your socks, Mia said. Both cops laughed and they headed inside, eventually reaching the office of Dr. Mukta Patwarden, which explained the Muck nickname, though not why the doctor put up with it. Thorndike knocked on the door, and an accented voice said, Come in! Opening the door, Mia saw a slender Indian woman with dark hair tied in a bun, a pointed nose, and very dark eyes. Looking up, she said, Red, fatso, it's good to see you both. How you doing, Muck? Sullivan asked. Mia managed to hold in a laugh. She wondered if Petwarden's nicknames for the cops was a response to being called Muck, or if she was the one who started it. I am very busy, but you are already aware of that. Who is this? She asked that last with a nod at Mia. Jerking a thumb at her, Thorndike said, This is Mia Fitzsimmons from the news. She's uh, following the VCU around for a month. Sarge figured she should meet you. Petwarden rose to her feet and offered a hand. Oh, really? It's a pleasure, Miss Fitzsimmons, and may I say you don't look a thing like the picture that accompanies your articles. I'll take that as a compliment. Mia had been bitching to Bart about that photo for a year now. She returned the handshake. Well, I'm quite the devoted reader. You are one of the few voices of reason on I1V1 in the press. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Of course, I have a vested interest. I don't know if Sergeant Gimpy told you or not, but I've been tasked with doing the autopsies for all the I1V1 cases, which means it is my curse to have to deal with the VCU. Ah, come on, Thorndike said with a grin. You love us, Muck. Patwardan gave the detective a look before saying, I assume you came down for the triple in the Bronx. Sullivan nodded. Yeah, we caught that. 
Well, you are about to catch a good deal more. Come with me. Getting up from behind the desk, Petwardan led the two detectives and Mia out of her office and toward the morgue. Sullivan hesitated. Do we have to... Hornbeck started. Not up, Johnny. It's just a couple of three stiffs. Actually, Petwardan said, it is more than that. She led them down the hall and through the large swinging metal doors. As soon as they entered the chilly room, decorated entirely in cold metals and harsh plastics, Sullivan's mouth burbled. Fuck! Thornbeck said, you gotta be kidding me. Excuse me! Sullivan managed to utter before running out of the morgue. Peshwardan shook her head. Every time. You'd think you, you would think you would grow accustomed. Hey, he's third grade. He didn't do homicides before he got shifted over to VCU. Thorndyke shrugged. Some people ain't got the stomach. Anyhow, Trujillo owes me 20 bucks now. Mia frowned. Huh? Thorndyke grinned. Uh, Hector said Sullivan wouldn't yak until the sheets came off the bodies. I didn't think he'd make it through the door. Then Thorndyke's face fell. You ain't gonna put that in the article, right? That prompted a smile from Mia. We'll see. Fuck. Thorndyke shook his head and then looked at Petwarda. So, what you got for us? The M.E. and two other orderlies all pulled the sheets away from the heads of the three victims, side by side, on three gurneys. Rafael Gesa had the same had the snout that was characteristic of chupacabras. Jason Johnson had teeth made of metal, and Alberto Soriano sadly looked just like a young man whose throat was ripped to pieces. Uh, the cause of death is fairly straightforward in all three cases. They all died of severe blood loss. In Soriano's case, it was through the carotid artery after it was torn apart by a metal hook that happens to match Johnson's foot said appendage had multiple traces of Soriano's blood on it. As for Johnson, he has multiple small puncture wounds on his face and considerable blood loss. In fact, it's approximately the same amount we found in the sacks on the tips of Gesa's fingers. Uh, Johnson also has blood on his teeth, which matches that of Gesa, who has a bite on his clavicle with metal shavings in it that match those of Johnson's teeth. Thorndike frowned. So the Bonsi killed Soriano and the Chup both, and the Chup killed the Bonsi. Holding both hands palm up, palms up, Petwarda then smiled, showing perfect teeth. Congratulations, Detective Fatso. I have just handed you three closed cases at once. Whoopie dingle. Sarge can show that off at the next CompStat meeting. Mia was scribbling furiously. There were plenty of instances of vampire on human violence and vice versa, but this sort of fight between two, va with two vampires with a human in the middle was unusual. A lot of vampires were huddling together. Some were your basic support group type things. Others more nasty, like the New Red Coalition that had been engaging in terrorist attacks all over North America. But there was a lot less of that in large cities like New York. Sure, some groups of vampires stuck together, but plenty were off on their own. Much easier to lose yourself in the crowded big city, after all. Now Petwardan held up a single finger. However, there is more. I have had several bodies sent over to me over the past 48 hours that fall under the purview of your unit. She walked over to another set of three pallets, this time uncovering the feet, which were desiccated husks. Mia looked at the M.E., recognizing the handiwork of a vampire from Armenian folklore. folklore. The Conovar? Petwarda nodded. Where'd you find these guys? Sunnyside? Belmont? Murray Hill? Thorndike listed three neighborhoods that had a heavy Armenian population. That's the bizarre part, I'm afraid. They were found in Brighton Beach, and two of them have I-1-V-1, and stingers under their tongues, so probably Upierci. She walked over to another pallet, where she revealed the face of a man who looked Russian. This gentleman was also found dead in Brighton Beach. Cause of death is a massive and comprehensive organ failure from no cause that I can determine. Given the neighborhood where he was found, my guess is an eretica. All four of our victims have ties to the Russian mob. Making more notes, Mia pondered. Scientists had spent a lot of time recently trying to figure out exactly how the eretica could just stare at someone and cause them to die. Most I1V1 mutations had some kind of scientific explanation, but the eretica had continued to baffle. Petwardan pointed at another two pallets. Those two have no cause of death that I can determine whatsoever, and they were found on the Lower East Side, not far from Chinatown. You're thinking hopping ghosts, Thorndike asked. Another nod from Petwardan. But they were not found in Chinatown, and the two victims are of Jamaican descent, with criminal records indicating that they are involved in the drug trade. Mia looked up. Thorndike, though, was shaking his head. Fuck. All right, Muck, get us the reports on all these guys. He pulled his cell phone out of his jacket pocket. It was almost lost in the detective's massive hand. After manipulating the touchscreen, he put it to his ear. Hey, Sarge, it doesn't look good here. We need to get somebody from Vice on the line. We may be looking at a drug war using vamps. 
transcript of interview with Sergeant Michael Yanov. Mia Fitzsimmons. And now we're recording. Sergeant Michael Yanov. Let me be clear about something. I will not discuss Michael Fane. I, w I talk to a department psychiatrist once a week, whether I need it or not, and between that and my cane and my Percocet prescription, I have plenty of reminders of fame. Clear? Um, okay, well, that kind of messes up my first question, which was going to be about how you got this post. Everyone knows that. Jerry Schmidt, God rest his soul, and I caught the Caitlin Montgomery murder. Two weeks later, we're overrun with vampires, my partner's dead, and I'm laid up in the hospital. A piece of unbreakable glass broke and tore into my leg. For this, the department decides I'm a vampire expert. They promote me and put me in charge of this stupid unit. Stupid? Look, they probably don't want you putting this in the article, but this unit is just spitting in the wind. The V-teams, they get resources, hardware, an actual budget. Meanwhile, we're lucky we have whiteboards and spotty Wi-Fi. Yes, we can call on ESU, assuming they're not busy somewhere else. You said that you're considered a vampire expert after encountering fame, but you and your partner actually called in a vampire expert. <laughs> yeah, that was actually my idea. Jerry and I went to Luther Swan's office at NYU and asked him to consult. Thanks to us, he's on TV every night, going on raids, testifying before Congress. He's the most famous person on the planet right now, all because I saw him a few times on those Discovery Channel shows my kids watch. Now he won't even return my phone calls. What exactly is the mandate of the Vampire Crimes Unit, Sergeant? <laughs> Honestly? Keep the stats and the precincts and the other units from getting out of hand. We've got more and more vampire crimes, and we can't close the cases. Either we don't have the manpower to take them down, or we can't even find them. Or the V-teams take them into federal custody, leaving us with an open case, since the feds generally can't be bothered to include us. But since all vampire-related crimes get kicked over to us as a special unit, our stats are counted separately. As a result, NYPD can say they're keeping a lid on crime, even with all the vampires. Sergeant, do you really want me to put all this in the article? What I really want is a scotch, so we're done here. If you want to ask me anything else, do it at the Bronx Ale House in about an hour and lose the recorder. The entire time he sat in the queue of trucks, waiting for clearance to depart the Red Hook Container Terminal, Jerome Whitmore kept staring at his passenger. Jerome hadn't been told the man's name, but his unusual feet and metal teeth made it clear that he was a Bonzi. Jerome had heard that Antoine had some on the payroll, but this was his first time seeing one up close. Finally, the Bonzi turned to look back. The fuck you look at him? His voice sounded funny because of the teeth. Jerome turned to stare back at the truck that was ahead of him. Nothing. Just drive the motherfucking truck, all right? I am driving it. Jerome bent his head back to crack his neck, the bottom of his dreads tickling his back as he did so. I've been driving it for two years now. Antoine ain't never put no security with me before. Why don't he trust me now? Ain't about you, motherfucker. Jerome glanced at it, down at his passenger's large metal hooks that served his feet. So what's it about? Ain't your problem, neither. My truck, my problem. Antoine's drugs in your truck, which means you shut the fuck up until we tell Popo who's been smuggling shit. Jerome shook his head. He'd been driving trucks in the city for 20 years, taking containers that arrived at the Red Hook port and bringing them to the various clients who hired the company he worked for. Plus, one client he'd taken on two years ago when the child support payments went up because LaShonda decided to send little Tyrese to private school. The good news was he got more visitations out of the deal, but the bad news was that he could only make the payments if he didn't pay rent. The landlord frowned on that, so he took his cousin up on the offer he'd made several times to haul stuff for his boss. Jerome had figured it was illegal, but he didn't realize how illegal until his truck hit a huge sinkhole on the Van Wyck Expressway. He pulled off at the next exit to make sure the cargo was okay, only to find heroin in one of the boxes. He was drug mealing. Not exactly what you'd call a good example for Tyrese, but what the hell else was he supposed to do? But now he had a Bonsi riding shotgun, with the only explanation being a text message from Antoine's burner phone saying, It's security, don't worry about it. Sure enough, the head gate guy, Jose, took one look at the Bonsi and said, Who's that? He noticed the teeth and then looked down to see the hooked feet. What's he doing here? Trainee, Jerome said without missing a beat. The bosses are doing some kind of affirmative action nonsense hiring vamps. Honestly, I think they just want someone they can pay less to and get away with it. Jose made a tch noise. Yeah. The rest of the exit procedure went smoothly, with nobody ever noticing that one of his boxes was filled with black tar heroin. Jerome then proceeded down Hamilton Avenue under the Gowanus Expressway. 
overpass. Traffic on the Gowanus was always a mess, and it was easier to drive on Hamilton, which ran under the elevated highway. As Jerome drove through the intersection of Hamilton and Bush Street, an SUV came zooming down Bush and plowed right into his truck. Jerome had thrown himself to the floor of the cab and put his arms up to protect his face before he consciously realized what was happening. The rat-tat-tat of gunfire, combined with the shattering of glass, created an ugly cacophony as the bullets slammed into the windshield, the window, and the mirrors. Never gonna see Tyrese again was all he could think as bullets flew over his head. The hail of bullets stopped, and Jerome glanced up to see that the Bonsi had also taken cover on the floor of the cab. But once the bullets stopped, and Jerome heard a voice say something in Russian, the Bonsi broke into a huge grin. Since his teeth were metal, it was the single scariest grin Jerome had ever seen in 36 years of life. The Bonsi threw the bullet, riddled the passenger door open, and rolled out of the cab. Raising himself up a bit to see more clearly, Jerome watched as the Bonsi rolled around the pavement on his shoulders and his, and his arms, while his legs whipped back and forth. There were about half a dozen white guys all holding AK-47s. Four black SUVs were blocking traffic on Hamilton in either direction, while Jerome's damaged truck was now blocking Bush. Razor-sharp hook feet slicing through the legs, torsos, and arms of the Russian. While the Bonsi twirled around on the ground like a breakdancer, the Russians tried to get their bearings and shoot him, but their shots all missed or went wild as the Bonsi was just too damn fast. After only a couple of seconds, the Russians were all bleeding on the street, dead or dying. The Bonsi clambered upright, sunlight glinting off his metal grin. He started walking slowly and awkwardly toward the truck like he was on stilts. Jerome was about to get out of the truck when he saw that the Bonsi hadn't actually killed all the Russians, just the ones with the AKs. A wrinkled little old lady, wearing a gray sweater and matching skirt, came walking slowly out from behind one of the SUVs, her eyes closed for some reason. Then she opened her eyes and looked right at the Bonsi. Jerome had never seen eyes like that before. God willing, he never would again. Shit! The Bonsi dove to the pavement and did his breakdancing act, twirling on his head and shoulders and arms toward the old woman. For her part, she was taken aback, apparently not expecting so bizarre an assault. Then the Bonsi's left foot cut the old lady's neck open and she fell to the street. More blood gushed out onto Hamilton Avenue, joining the ever-growing pool. Jerome fumbled for his cell phone. The Bonsi didn't get back to his feet, instead crawling toward the truck. Jerome saw a rictus of agony in his face and wondered what happened to him. Nobody had actually touched him. He pointed at Jerome. Do not call the fucking cops. You feel me, motherfucker? For a second, Jerome just stared at his phone. Then he looked back at the Bonsi. I was gonna call Antoine. The Bonsi winced in pain. You do not tell nothing to nobody, motherfucker. Then he fell face down on the pavement. Jerome heard sirens. He wondered what the hell was going to happen now. No matter what, though, he had the feeling Tyrese wasn't going to be able to going to going to be going to private school for much longer. Mia sat next to Detective Madawi Bio on the Roosevelt Island tram tram as the cable car wended its way across the East River, the 59th Street Bridge on the right, several newly constructed apartment buildings on the left. Mia wondered idly if the owners of the building warned prospective tenants on the upper floors that tram riders would be able to see right into their homes. Bio had invited her on this trip, but had been tight-lipped about the specifics, only saying that he was visiting a confidential informant. As they went out over the river, Mia said, I'm surprised that you've been able to develop CI so quickly. The unit's only a few months old. The detective, an African-American man in his 40s, smiled to reveal a very expensive dental appliance. Good police always have CIs. That's where the real work's done. You don't talk to people. You don't develop relationships. You ain't police. You're just some thug who arrests people sometimes. He shook his head. At least that's what Papa always said. You walk a beat, you got to know everyone on every corner, or you ain't doing nothing but showing off your fancy uniform. But you know the people, then you can keep the peace. And maybe we can't always do that, but at the very least we can get things back to peace when it gets broke. The tram started downward toward the Roosevelt Island terminus, a long strip of land between Manhattan and Queens. The island was mostly residential these days, though it started out life as a prison and as the location of several hospitals and insane asylums. She looked at Bia. Your father was a cop? And my grandfather. <laughs> Not my great-grandfather, though, because they weren't too keen on black folks being cops back then. The smile came out again. Actually, they weren't too keen on Grandpa, neither. I'm surprised. I figured with a name like yours, you were a second-generation immigrant. I am on my mom's side. She was born in Kenya, and I was named after her pop. I 
never knew him. He died on the boat coming over here. But my father's side has been here since before the Civil War. Mia start nodded, making notes. Watching her do so, Bio said, Look, I want you to understand something. If any specifics of this meeting go in your article, I will hunt you down. You understand? The C in CI is for confidential, and I take that very seriously. Keep it very, very vague. She made a show of putting her notebook away. So why did you ask me along? Because all everyone's talking about is the war against the monsters. But these aren't monsters. They're people. Figured you should meet one. The tram came to a stop, and one set of doors opened to allow the passengers to disembark. The other set of doors led on passengers headed to Manhattan, which didn't open until the island-bound folks cleared out. If you wanted to ride the tram right back, you had to go out and come back in, paying the full fare. As they walked down the ramp toward West Road, Bio said, NYPD's always been about maintaining order. It's really all you can do in a city this big. It's funny, every commissioner they appoint has all these grandiose plans about how they're going to run the force right and chain fix things, and then nothing significant changes. And they quit, or they get fired. Teddy Roosevelt, you ever look at his life? He's a man who succeeded at everything he ever did, from San Juan Hill to the Natural History Museum, all the way up to being president. But even he couldn't handle being an NYPD commissioner. It's the only job he ever quit. They walked down Met West, Mia occasionally glancing to her right to take in the bright lights and varied architecture of the Manhattan skyline. The city court building, with its slanted roof, stood out amid the hodgepodge of buildings that were constructed in any multitude of eras from the 19th century to last week. Right now, the Vamps are just like every other immigrant group that's come into town. You know, when the Irish and Italians first arrived, all the Dutch and English types would turn their noses up and not want to give them jobs and wish they'd go back where they came from. <laughs> Nothing changes. He shook his head. Only this time, the immigrants got superpowers, at least some of them. And the whole damn U.S. military is out to kill them. But that's the Fed's problem. For us, we got to keep doing what the police are supposed to do. Make the peace. Eventually, they worked their way to the demolished campus of the Kohler Goldwater Specialty Hospital, which had closed its doors and was scheduled to make way for a Cornell University campus. Construction had halted a few months ago for reasons that were never made public, though one of Mia's colleagues had been trying to dig into it. A huge bird flew overhead, buzzing the pair of them. Mia was no kind of expert, but she knew they didn't generally breed birds to be 200 pounds, which meant it had to be someone with I-1-V-1. Sure enough, the bird landed behind one of the half-demolished walls of the former hospital. As it came in for a landing, Mia noticed a satchel around the bird's neck. Ow! Oh, fuck! That always hurts, came a voice a few moments later from behind the wall. A few more moments, and a very attractive African-American man walked out from behind the wall, buttoning a shirt. Bio fumbled in his backpack, and then pulled out a pouch that contained blood. He tossed it to the gentleman, who caught it unerringly, and after glancing down at it, regarded the detective with a raised eyebrow. Cattle blood, Bio said, straight from the butcher. The gentleman grinned. My man! He ripped open the pouch and gulped down all the blood therein. Mia blinked and realized something disquieting. She'd been reporting vampire-related stories for the news since the Bronx District Attorney candidate she'd been covering announced to the world that he was a loop guru. Yet this was her first time actually watching somebody drink blood. What struck her as odd was how, well, ordinary it looked. Like someone drinking from a canteen during a hike. Hits the spot! He tossed, tossed the pouch aside, where it was quickly lost in the other detritus that it collected in the construction site. She looked at him and said, Impundulu? The fuck do I care? Just call me Bird. He looked at Bio while holding out a hand toward Mia. Who's this? Mia Fitzsimmons from the Daily News. She's embedded with the VCU, and I wanted her to meet a real... But Bird was backing up. What the hell, motherfucker? What you doing bringing a reporter here? She's one of the good ones. She's the one who covered Big Charlie. Bird stopped backing off and looked at her. You wrote that one? Uh, what's it? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning? Mia nodded, both relieved and flattered. She actually got nominated for a couple of awards for that piece, though it didn't win anything, deemed too controversial because it didn't out-and-out out condemn the vampires. That was me. That was some righteous shit you wrote. All right, fine, what's up? We've been seeing a lot of vamp-on-vamp -vamp violence, and it's looking like it's connected to the drug crews. Bird nodded. Yeah, that's some fucked-up shit right there. Look, I got my people, okay? We be hanging out and staying out of trouble and trying to find us some blood. We don't go for that New Red Coalition terrorist bullshit. So no terrorists, but you'll enforce for drug crews? How are we supposed to get paid, motherfucker? 
Bert held up his hand. Hey, I ain't going for that shit. But that don't mean my brothers and sisters won't. There's some mad cash in the game. Look, Bert, we've got multiple drug-related homicides committed by your brothers and sisters. I got a Bonsi and a Choop killing each other in the Bronx, working for rival crews. I've got Jamaican dealers killed by hopping ghosts, two Yoops killed by Dax, and another Bonsi and an Eretica killing each other in Brooklyn. Mia shot a look at Bio, vaguely amused that nobody had come up with a good nickname for Eretica. Bird truck. Come on, yo, we need to eat like everybody else. Indicating the discarded blood pouch with her head, Mia said, well, not exactly like everybody else. Yeah, you're funny, but shit still costs. So the pay is good enough to kill their own kind? Mia asked. Bird just stared at her, and Bio also fixed her with a confused look. The latter said, drug dealers have been killing their own kind for as long as there have been drug dealers. Yeah, I, I know that, detective. That wasn't an expression of surprise. I was asking a question. Reporter, remember? Bert grinned. I like her. She's funny. And she got a point. We ain't usually taking up arms unless it's against you motherfuckers, not our own kind. We usually don't shit on our own. Thing is, I used to be in the game back in the day. This ain't no drive-bys. This is up close and personal. And that only happens when the killer knows where the killee is going to be. Know what I mean? Intelligence leaks, Bio said. Happens all the time. Nah, not like this. What you're talking about happens every once in a while. But this? This shit's all wrong. Happening way too much. Especially when Cruz is using their own, our kind. You feel me? Bio nodded. Okay. That it? So I gotta bounce. Nice meeting you, reporter lady. Keep writing that good shit. He turned and started unbuttoning his shirt, moving back to the broken wall so he could finish undressing in private before turning back into a huge bird. As soon as Mia arrived at the second floor landing of the VCU tenement, Yanov called out from across the floor. Fitzsimmons, my office, now. All the detectives, even Trujillo, Bio, and Thorndyke, who all actually seemed to like her, were eyeing her as she walked across the floor toward one of the cubicle walls that separated Yanov's desk from everyone else's, giving him a makeshift office. As soon as Fitzsimmons entered, Yanov pointed at a copy of today's New York Post on his desk. The front page headline read, Gang War with a picture of the crime scene from Hamilton Avenue. The subhead read, Drug Lords Use Vampires for Mayhem. What do you have to say about this? Mia glanced at Yanov, who was glaring at her with intense brown eyes. Well, I'm surprised they didn't go for a bad pun in the headline, and I think headline writers are the only people in the world who still use mayhem in a sentence. Yanov pointed an accusatory finger at Mia. Cut the bullshit, please. Are you responsible for this? Seriously? We've managed to keep this out of the press. Narcotics has been having a field day since we brought that truck driver in, and we've got several closed cases thanks to vampires killing each other. Nobody's noticed the pattern yet, so nothing in the papers until this. He tapped his cane on the desk on the top of the paper. Okay, first of all, did you not read the memo that says I work for the news? That's the post, which isn't so much a newspaper as something handy to line the litter box with. Your deal says you can't reveal anything until the article's out, but that's only for your paper. Mia just shook her head. So I took it to my biggest competitor? On what planet does that make sense? Sergeant, let me be clear. I'd sooner drive a white-hot poker through my eyeball than give the Post an exclusive. So tell me how they found out about it. Well, they do have reporters working for them, and I have it on good authority that some of them have even achieved sentience. It's possible that one of them figured it out. Yanov shook his head. Either way, this just turned into a press case. Our deal still stands. Your paper can send someone else to cover this and ask me questions that I won't answer? What you see here does not leave your notebook until your month is up. Clear? Crystal. Mia went into the bullpen, heading for the counter that had all the caffeine fixings. Trujillo was dumping a scoop full of sugar into a coffee mug with the NYPD logo on it. As Mia reached for a similar mug, she smirked at the detective. You want some coffee with that sugar? Trujillo snorted. Used to drink coffee black, then I became a cop. He shook his head. So you remind the Sarge that you don't work for the Post? Mia chuckled as she poured her coffee into the mug, which she had taken the time to rinse out just in case. Yeah, he doesn't get the whole rivals thing, does he? Eh, more like he doesn't give a shit. A reporter broke the case open, which always pisses the bosses off. When the bosses get pissed, the commanders get reamed. Nodding, Mia said, and the abused kicked downward. Trujillo grinned under his thick mustache. Right, which means you get to go home and kick your cat tonight. Mia took a thoughtful sip of her coffee, then made a face, thinking that Trujillo had the right idea with his sugar additive. So anybody figure out where the leak is? What? The leak. 
Mia shook her head. Didn't Bio tell you that someone's letting the crews know where to strike? Yeah, he told me. Who gives a shit? Mia's eyes wide. Excuse me? Trujillo shook his head. Look, nobody in the real world gives two shits about why. Motive has never once helped me close a case, except maybe to point me at someone to talk to. What we do is who and how. Why is the perp shrink problem? I don't know why the vamps were killing each other in drug raids. I also don't give a shit. Yeah, well, I'm not a cop. I'm a journalist. No shit. Trujillo grinned. Thought you were the new secretary. Rolling her eyes, Mia took another sip of the awful coffee. Yanov said, all right, people, let's get to work. After the top of shift briefing was over, Mia went over to one of the spare computer terminals and connected to the NYPD's intranet. She had been given a temporary account with limited access, basically only to things that would be available to the general public anyhow. The intranet access mostly just meant she could see some of that stuff before it was released. The VCU had been working with narcotics on tracking all the violence between crews. They had seized an impressive amount of heroin and cocaine amid the dead bodies, and a lot of crews were hurting. They made bunches of arrests, too. For the rest of the day, Mia made a methodical search of all the case files. She found corpses that were Impundulu and Assassabonsum, both from African vampire lore, Eretica, which was mistyped as Erotica in more than one report, and Yupierchi, both from Russia, Chupacabra and Luke Guru, both from Latin America, Jiangxi, China, and Dakananabar, Armenia. Mia abhorred racial profiling. However, a lot of the drug dealing in the town was divided up by race. The crews tended to stick with their own kind, and most of the dealing was done by African Americans, Latinos, Russians, and Chinese, with a bit by Armenians. There was one ethnic group, however, peculiarly missing from all the reports. Mia stared down at her tablet, scrolling through her email, the late afternoon breeze blowing through her short brown hair as she sat at a table in front of the cafe on East 187th Street in the Bronx. An espresso sat cooling at her side as yet untouched. An older gentleman wearing a gray fedora, a checked button-down shirt, and a gray cardigan sat across from her. How's your espresso? He asked in a friendly tone. Mia smiled and took a sip. It was not only cool enough to drink, but also akin to the nectar of the gods after swilling the sludge at VCU. Delicious. How are you, Secundo? With a shrug, Secundo Amalfitano said, Ah, the doctor keeps telling me not to smoke what I like to smoke or eat what I like to eat. I tell him my nonna lived to be 102 eating what I eat. Mia chuckled, but not smoking what you smoke? Secundo chuckled right back. No, I suppose not. So what is it you want from an old man, Mia? I know you're retired, Secundo, but I'm wondering if you can tell me how business has been lately. Business is business. Secundo got the attention of one of the young women waiting tables. Cappuccino? The woman nodded. You bet. Grazie. The waitress dashed back inside. My family's business has not changed, Mia. Our construction company? Come on, Secundo, cut the shit. Secundo frowned, his wrinkled face growing a few more wrinkles. Such language from a lady. Mia winced. She'd been hanging out with the cops too long. I'm sorry. Look, Secundo, I know what your family business really is. I know how you got the information you gave me for those stories about corruption in the city council and the zoning commission. I know because it's because they took somebody else's bribes instead of yours, or was it that they took yours and still didn't give you the contracts? The frown deepened. Mia, you are asking questions you should not ask. I'm a journalist, Secundo. There are no questions I shouldn't ask. And even if there were, the ones I absolutely have to ask are the ones that the person I'm asking doesn't want to answer. She took a sip of her espresso and reminded herself to be careful, as this was a man who was ordering people assassinated before Mia was born. Allegedly. You didn't ask questions then. I didn't need to, and maybe I should have. Secundo leaned back in his chair and took the fedora off, revealing a bald crown with wisps of white hair. He set the hat down on the table and ran his hand over his head to pat down the hair that was now flying out in all directions. In that case, Mia, perhaps you should ask the actual question you want to ask. Fine. There's a gang war going on. Crews stealing other crews' stashes, and their vampire enforcers are killing each other. Blacks killing Latinos, Armenians killing Russians, Chinese killing Jamaicans, and so on. But I'm noticing a distinct lack of the Cosa Nostra there. Shaking his head, Secundo said, You think we're too weak to get involved, is that it? It's not what I'm saying at all. I mean, you guys are weak, or at least weakened. The Godfather made you guys hip, the Sopranos made you guys obvious, and reality made you less and less relevant. But somebody 
has been feeding information to all the crews and telling them where to strike their rivals. It's chaos out there now. And I'm wondering who would benefit from that the most. And a throaty chuckle built in Secundo's throat, and then it exploded into full-on laughter. Then it modulated into a coughing fit, and Mia leaned forward, concerned. Secundo held up a hand, got his coughing under control, and sat back upright. The waitress brought his cappuccino and asked, You all right? He nodded. I am fine, but could you please bring me some ice water? Of course. She dashed off again. Secundo poured a bit of sugar into his cappuccino and stirred it, making the foam atop it swirl around. I laugh because you see what you do not see. We do not wish to increase our trade in filthy poison. Mia frowned, but that doesn't make sense. Why cripple the crews if you don't... She trailed off as she remembered that there were two common elements to all of what she'd seen lately. One was drugs. She stared at Secundo. You're going after the vampires. Of course. It is what we have always done. The legends of crosses and holy water defeating vampires, they are because the Cosa Nostra served as the warriors who battled the Striga and Vampiro for the Vatican. Mia shook her head. Son of a bitch. But as you so rudely put it, we are weak. We cannot wage a full-scare war on Vampiro, as the government has been with their soldiers. However, we may fight smaller battles along the way. Secundo stopped stirring his cappuccino and sipped it, then licked the foam off his upper lip. You will, of course, not write of this. It wasn't a question. My editor is persnickety about on-the-record sources, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say you're not willing to be quoted. Secundo just stared at her from over the lip of his mug, taking another sip. Right. She finished her espresso off. Thanks, Secundo. It's good to see you again. Pleasure was mine, Mia. I have always enjoyed your company. Secundo put his mug down and stared at her intently. I would very much hate to never enjoy it again. As Mia reached for her purse, Secundo said, No, I will pay. Thank you. Rising, she offered her hand. Take care, Secundo. The old man took her hand and kissed the top of it. His lips felt like sandpaper, but Mia smiled gamely anyhow and pretended that Secundo didn't just threaten her life. She walked down Arthur Avenue toward Fordham Road and the bus that would take her home. While she waited at the bus stop, she started making notes on her tablet. The article on the VCU would get written, and it would talk about the cops she'd been hanging around with and the job they had to do, and it would talk about the gang war, and she wouldn't specify why this was happening. After all, it wasn't sourced, and besides, it would spoil the narrative. Trujillo's rant on motive would make good copy, maybe a sidebar for the article, and actually providing motive would undercut that. Besides, the article was about a unit of the NYPD. What Secundo just told her was deep background for a news story, one she intended to write no matter what Secundo wanted or threatened. And that's the end. Um, I would love to write a follow-up on that. I don't know if I'll get to because um, since View Wars was unfortunately canceled by Netflix, the TV show, um, it's likely there won't be any more anthologies in the series, which is, which is kind of too bad. It was a fun series. I strongly recommend picking them up. You can get them from IDW Publishing. Um, there are, I think, five anthologies altogether. Um, so check those out. Uh, edited by Jonathan Mayberry and a lot of really good authors uh, contributing stories to them over the years. Um, thank you very much for watching. Uh, you can find me online at decandido.net. You can read my blog at decandido.wordpress.com. And please, if you could support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash cred, that would be awesome. Thank you very much, and please stay safe.